praise. Every word of worship with one accord. Every
praise Jehovah in all his splendor. Praise Jehovah for his majesty. We praise your name. We praise your name. Lord Jehovah, we praise you.
It is indeed an honor to be back here at St. Matthew's to celebrate your homecoming. I want to thank Pastor Beverly for her gracious invitation extended to me when we first met. And it is my honor to come back again. I spent a summer here, I won't tell you, it was back in the 70s. Seems like yesterday, but it was a while back that I was a summer intern at Duke Divinity School, Bishop Joe, well then, Reverend Joe Bethay, who was at Duke, who said, you should go to Greensboro. <laughs> and I came here and Reverend Faree said, you're gonna run a summer enrichment program. <laughs> and so we had a summer enrichment program and um, Mrs. Weta Scarborough, who took it her project to feed me periodically, <laughs> invited me to a lunch, a luncheon at her place, and there I met Bishop Etzel Ammons, who said to me, young man, what are you gonna do when you finish seminary? And I said, I'm gonna go uh, maybe work on my doctorate in and he said, in what? I said, in pastoral counseling. And he said, what schools are you looking at? I said, Princeton and University of Chicago. And he said, what about Northwestern University, Garrett Evangelical Seminary? He said, they have a program in pastoral counseling. In fact, they have four black students in that program. And so I said, I didn't know that. So I applied and he said, when you apply, you should mention my name which I did, and so I went there and did my doctoral studies. But St. Matthew's was a fueling station for me. You know, we need those fueling stations in life where we get energy to go on on our journey. And St. Matthew's was that for me. I want to thank and appreciate the other pastors that are here, your outstanding choir for inspiring your inspiring word in music. And I give encouragement to Minister Curry, I mean Minister Yours as he begins his journey at Hood. He probably won't have to take any of my classes. I'm teaching in the doctor ministry program as well, but maybe when he gets to that stage he'll come across my path. In the book of Psalms 139, I simply want to read verses 1 and 3 and verses 7 and 9 in Psalm 139. Then I'll direct you to John, our text for today. O Lord, you have searched me and known me, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. And then in the Gospel of John, in the fourth chapter of John, beginning at verse 7, we find a very familiar story involving a young woman. A Samaritan woman went over to get some water Jesus said, give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into the city to buy some food. The Samaritan woman asked him, how can a Jewish man like you ask a Samaritan woman like me for a drink of water? Jews, of course, didn't associate with Samaritans. 
Jesus replied to her, if you only knew what God's gift is and who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink and he would have given you living water. A journey home to meet destiny. Have you seen him? A journey home to meet destiny. Have you seen him? Let us pray. Oh God, help us, guide us, teach us, but most of all, Lord, love us. In thy name we pray. Amen. How do we journey from home to the spiritual places that are important to us? As a pastoral counselor and as a licensed family therapist, I tend to read the Word of God for its guidance about redemptive relationships and about how we journey well through life in the face of tension, in the face of conflict, in the face of suffering. How do we find hope and energy to persist and to love God's creation and to be all that God has created us to be. The story of Jesus' encounter with the woman of Samaria, a small country between Judea and Galilee, a place that had been a part of the kingdom of Israel. When the Israelites were taken captive by the king of Assyria, strangers from other places made their residence there. The strangers heard about the Israelite God, but they never worshiped the God at the Jerusalem temple. They built their own worship temples in their own place. Enmity grew between them. Jesus as a Jew was part of this despised group. Thus in their travels from Jerusalem, the Galileans Jews would tend to avoid the shortcut through Samaria, but would take the extended route, crossing over the Jordan and then along the bordering area where the resented groups of people lived. But you and I know that Jesus travels a different way. Amen. Amen. Jesus travels pure paths. Yeah. Jesus makes truth steps. Jesus pursues life-giving ground. He was on a journey and he had no bones to pick with the Samaritans. No bitterness, no hatred. Jesus chooses not to carry the cultural burden of hatred. He was on the way back to his hometown, Nazareth. But he had an appointment with destiny. That's the name that I give this woman because the author John does not tell us who her name is. I call her destiny, not destiny's child, <laughs> but destiny. Traveling with his disciples, they enter a small village of Sychar where there is a historic wayside well dug by Jacob, Abraham's grandson. In his fatigue and in his providence, Jesus stopped there to rest and to refresh himself. You know, we as Christians need to find places where we can rest from the work that we're doing in order to go on and see what the end is going to be. Yeah. Come on. But he just didn't stop there for a drink of water. He stopped there to redeem a lost soul's and a lost sister. The disciples went on into town to fetch some groceries. But so how do you and I, how do we communicate our story to Jesus, who just happens 
to wander into our lives. Destiny enters and she notices the stranger Jew sitting at the well. She psychologically reflexes because it was an automatic prejudice. And in her mind, I can imagine she's saying, ignore him. He ain't like us. She quickly lowers her jar with the rope. And she has no assistant, as normally is the case. No other female is with her, which should have been. She filled her jug, and she's about to step off. Jesus makes a verbal request. Jesus says something that most men, even in this modern day, can't say, which is, I need, I need. There are two other words men don't like to say either, is I hurt and I can't. Now that's for another day. She responds like any other well-conditioned victim by drawing distinctions, by making difference, by diverting, by distorting. She uses the cultural study storyline. We're not supposed to be talking to each other. We're not allowed to interact with each other. So how can you ask me for a drink of water? Jesus who is on his way home, has found destiny on his journey. She is emotionally thirsty. She is alone and she is isolated. She is hungry for conversation. She desperately needs to be respected and affirmed. He wants to teach her a love lesson since she likely has been abused. Does that sound familiar? She has been rejected. She has been discarded by the five previous men in her life who could simply say three words or three phrases to her and she would be history. All the men that she previously were related to in marriage could simply say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And she's history. That's the way life goes then. And that's a fact, Jack. (laughs) But Jesus has another word. Jesus says to her, I've got something to give to you that will satisfy your thirst for a lifetime. Ah, she says to Jesus, That's interesting talk, mister, but if you've got it, give it to me. Jesus can't get the water because she says he has no resources. But see, she can't see spiritually what she's up against. Jesus is talking about living water, life-giving water, life-enhancing water, life-changing water. Jesus drives destiny to a new decision. Destiny now is interested because she is tired of this lonely trek to get some water. She's tired of being ignored. She's tired of being ridiculed. She is ready for a life shift. And she says to Jesus, if you've got it, give it to me. Therapeutic work is now underway. She tells Jesus the truth that he already knows. He tells her about the relationships in her life. And she, when he does that, she attempts to do what? She attempts to change the subject. She starts talking about that they are involved in different religions that God prefers the Jewish religion or the Samaritan religion. And Christ makes it plain. 
And then finally, Jesus, you don't often hear Jesus confessing, but Jesus confesses to her. This strange woman at the well, Jesus said to her, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. And this woman shouts. I imagine she said, wow. Oh, my God. And when she does that, she drops her water bucket and she goes like the roadrunner into town. And she uses her megaphone voice and she says, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Jesus has turned a refreshment station on the way home into a Holy Spirit, hallelujah, hour and encounter. Jesus has made this a salvation stop. You and I need that as we travel through life. Destiny gained at least three things in this encounter. And I think these three things are possible for you and for me. Our ultimate need in life is to acknowledge our spiritual need for God's love. It is not a one-time affair. So if you've walked down this aisle once and said, Lord, I want you in my life, it's not just a one-time affair. It's like sparkling pure water that we drink every day. You know, water is essential for good living. Not only to take good showers or baths in, but to drink, to refresh our plants, even to refresh the earth. It's like flowing love and God reminds us periodically when God sends the rain to refresh the earth or to refill a creek or a lake or an ocean or a waterfall or a flood even that some people curse. When we think about water and God's living water, we should say God's love still flows. God's love still flows. And as the psalmist declared in the form of a question that I read earlier, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, when I visited people in prison and spoke with young men and women in prison and I tell them, this is not a God forsaken place. God will go wherever you are. God's love will reach out and grab you wherever you are. I've met some of the most brilliant people in my travels in prison. And I say to the brother, what are you doing here? God loves you and God needs you. Where can I go from your presence? You know, all, most of you have the GPS. Those of you who drive have GPS systems in your car. And I consider the GPS that located destiny was God's private seeker. Amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, we embrace God's true desire for our growth and our well-being. We are challenged to embrace the words that this woman may have said and maybe some of us have said, I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just couldn't keep it to myself. Lord, I just couldn't keep it to myself. The words of Jesus are great, but if you and I must join destiny's voice and action and tell someone, that's your challenge for me to you today. Tell someone that Jesus loves them. Tell them about the way of Jesus. Better still, show them the way of Jesus. And how do you do that? Pastor, you do it by simply showing good hospitality to those who are lost. By sharing with them God's liberating word, God's non-judgmental love. By being righteous 
And righteousness is simply right thinking, right action, and right attitude. And then the call of Jesus to become agents of healing and ambassadors. May your journey today at this homecoming lead you to have special conversations with strangers at the water fountains where you work, at the water fountains at school, at the water fountains at the sports events that we go to. And may this be Jesus entering those conversations. May God bless you as you journey home to meet destiny. Have you seen him? Amen.